Tonight, breaking news. The deal just announced. The offer to Russia to bring WNBA star Brittany Griner home. The Biden administration offering a Russian prisoner in exchange for Griner and jailed American Paul Whelan. News of the deal breaking after Griner testified in a Russian courtroom for the first time. The gold medalist shackled and behind bars. What she told the courtroom about the moment she was detained in a Moscow airport and how soon a prisoner swap could happen. Here at home, the Fed's aggressive move, hiking interest rates at a record pace for the second straight month. Credit card payments, car loans, and bank loans all expected to get more expensive, but will it be enough to slow soaring inflation and stave off a recession? And what it all means for your bottom line? Plus, the Justice Department investigating former President Trump's actions as part of its criminal probe into the deadly Capitol riot and attempts to overturn the election. Their investigation moving faster than many had thought. Pete Williams standing by with the latest. Also tonight, the funeral mix-up. A family shocked to discover the body they lowered into the ground was not their loved one. How the funeral home is explaining the mistake and the $50 million lawsuit just filed. Plus, splash landing. The small plane going down at a popular beach site near Seattle. The bystanders who rushed in to help and how that pilot is doing tonight. And influencers versus Instagram. The major changes that have some social media stars up in arms. How TikTok is driving a major shift on the platform and why it has so many users like the Kardashians so upset. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Tonight, a glimmer of hope as Brittany Griner sits in a Russian jail cell, a possible prisoner swap now on the table. Griner appearing in a Moscow courtroom today, testifying for the first time since the start of her trial. The WNBA star detailing the moment she was taken into custody at the airport in February, explaining the cannabis found in her luggage was for medicinal purposes. Just hours after that testimony, news of the swap. The U.S. working to negotiate the release of both Griner and Paul Whelan in exchange for a convicted Russian arms dealer. Whelan, who was arrested on espionage charges, has been held in a Russian prison since 2018. And another potential diplomatic breakthrough, Secretary of State Antony Blinken saying he plans to call his Russian counterpart, Sergei Lavrov, for the first time since the start of the war in Ukraine. But Russia says they have received no such invitation just yet. Still, the unmistakable air of progress tonight after an agonizing 160 days behind bars for one of the world's top female athletes. Chief Washington correspondent Andrea Mitchell leads us off tonight. With Brittany Griner caged in a Russian court today, testifying for the first time in her own defense, the Secretary of State going public about a deal to bring her and another American, Paul Whelan, home, calling it a top priority. We put a substantial proposal on the table weeks ago to facilitate their release. That proposal, trading Victor Boot, an arms dealer known as the Merchant of Death, serving a 25-year sentence in the U.S. for the Americans. Two sources familiar tell NBC News. What is the prospect of getting Paul Wine, Whelan and Brittany Griner out by making such a big trade, arguably over the opposition of the Justice Department? I can't and won't get into any of the details of what we proposed to the Russians um, over the course of um, of so many weeks now. The president is prepared to make tough decisions um, if it means the safe return of Americans. Griner in court today holding pictures of her wife and teammates, explaining she didn't know the cannabis prescribed back home for medical use was in her luggage, facing questions from Russian prosecutors and the Russian judge. I was in a rush packing. Um, like I said, I was recovering from COVID, stress of packing, making sure I had my COVID tests, jet lag. And I was in a rush, throwing my stuff into my bag. The WNBA star telling the judge when she arrived in Russia five months ago, she was held for hours without a lawyer, interrogated in Russian, using her phone to try to Google Translate. She says made to sign documents without knowing what she was signing. No, uh, my rights were never read to me. Uh, no one explained any of it to me. Griner has pleaded guilty to the charges against her and faces up to 10 years in prison. Her legal team hoping her testimony will help her get a more lenient sentence.
All right, Andrea Mitchell joins us now from D.C. And, Andrea, I know there's been a late-breaking development. We do have to be careful here because I know it's coming from the Russian side. But the Russians are responding to the request for that phone call from our Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to their foreign minister. What, what are they saying? Well, TASS, which is the Russian state media, is saying that they have no such formal request. There are their own channels between Secretary Blinken and Lavrov. They always have been. They've worked together for years. But Lavrov may be playing hard to get, because Tony Blinken has been shunning him since Ukraine in, was invaded by Russia. And even a couple of weeks ago at a G20 meeting, wouldn't meet with him. So now that he wants to talk about Brittany Griner and Paul Whelan, uh, Lavrov may take a little while before responding. Andrew, you know Washington better than maybe anyone, so I wanted to ask you, there are multiple components here for, for the White House to make this decision, right? There's the humanitarian one. You have two right. Americans uh, right now in a Russian prison. You have the political one, a high-profile U.S. athlete now in Russian custody. And then the national security issue, right? What does this open up to other rogue nations that want to take uh, U.S. Uh, people captive? Do we know how the White House reached this decision? Well, the president made the decision ultimately, and it was over the objections of the Justice Department. Typically, the FBI, the Justice Department, they work so hard to find these criminals, these Russian criminals, and don't want to see a criminal traded for an innocent American. It's not an equal trade. They don't want to give up someone that is serving a 25-year sentence, as Victor Boot is. He's known as the Merchant of Death. That said, uh, this has now reached a stage where they have to make a trade, and the best they can do probably is get at least get Paul Whelan out. So it's not a one-for-one -one trade. Get this American businessman who is uh, uh, in prison for four years now on a trumped-up charge of spying, which is totally not true, according to all U.S. officials. It's a very tough decision. It was made by the president, and politics has to play a role. This Griner. Uh, hostage-taking, really, has become a big issue, and the president got involved. So much at stake for those families and, of course, for the White House as well. All right, Andrea, thank you. So how would this prisoner swap work, and why is it taking so long for Russia to agree to this exchange? To help answer those questions, I want to bring in Danielle Gilbert. She's a fellow in U.S. foreign policy and international security at Dartmouth College and an expert in prisoner swaps throughout the world. She's also a friend to Top Story. Danielle, welcome back to the show. So I, I want to ask you this. Thanks. It's being reported that for the first time ever, the U.S. government publicly revealed a concrete plan to secure the release of American detainees. Are you surprised by this move from Blinken and the Biden administration? I mean, what do you think prompted this? I was surprised to hear the announcement today because normally we don't hear about these deals until after they have concluded and Americans are coming home. In the past, the U.S. government has had to make concessions, including prisoner swaps, to get our people home when they are unlawfully or wrongfully detained overseas or when they are held hostage. But I think that the announcement today tells us a couple things. It reminds us that the White House is working on these cases around the clock. It reminds us that Russia is the bad actor here and that they don't seem to want to take yes for an answer. And so we're going to see these negotiations continue to unfold. I agree. It takes some pressure off the White House right now. But the thing that stood out to me when I was reading all the reports about this was that this offer was made weeks ago, if not a month ago. Why do you think the Russians mm -hmm. have taken so long? I think the Russians won't agree to a deal until the trial has come to its conclusion. So right now, it's all a hypothetical in terms of what Brittany Griner might face for her punishment, how long that sentence would be. But once the trial has concluded, once they reach a verdict and give her the punishment that we are expecting them to give her of years of hard labor in a Russian penal colony, that increases their leverage and decreases the position of the United States. At the moment, Everything is just hypothetical. But once that is reached, it ups the ante for a negotiation. So you've studied these prisoner swaps all over the world. And the question I have is, mm -hmm. does this open the door to rogue regimes kidnapping Americans down the line because they'll know they'll get a prisoner swap or at least something from the White House? It's a huge risk. Every time that the White House makes concessions, we are teaching our adversaries all around the world that hostage taking is a successful strategy. But the problem with adopting a no concessions policy is that there are so often exceptions, and it's really painful for the individual families and communities that are facing these horrible arrests. And so 
The most important thing for the administration to do now is use the tools that it has on the table to get our people back and then focus entirely on a punishment and prevention strategy. What can we do to make sure that this never happens to an American ever again? Finally, do you think Paul Whelan ever gets out, if not for Brittany Griner? It's a great question. So in a lot of these past cases, there are multiple prisoners who are negotiated for at the same time. Sometimes what one of these states will do is agree to release multiple prisoners, and then not everyone gets on the airplane together, and only a couple of people come home. So the Russians know that, as do Iran, Venezuela, China, that have done this to our citizens so many times. And so the White House is going to be working as much as possible to make sure that that deal brings them both home together. Danielle Gilbert, we appreciate you joining Top Story tonight. Thanks again. We want to turn now to the Fed's major rate hike today as it tries to slow inflation. The move making things like buying a car, financing a home, or paying off credit cards likely more expensive. NBC's Tom Costello now on what it tells us about the health of the economy. The Federal Reserve doesn't like to surprise, and today it delivered just what it promised. A unanimous decision by the Federal Reserve to hike interest rates by 75 basis points. A big move, three quarters of a point, the most aggressive series of rate hikes since the early 90s, as the Fed tries to catch up with runaway inflation. The goal to bring inflation down from 9% now to roughly 2%. The price hikes continue eating into both family and small business budgets. In Las Vegas, Jill Schlesinger opened a gluten and sugar-free bakery, but exploding ingredient prices are threatening her business. I walk the line every month. I literally have so much credit card debt from starting the business because I couldn't get any loans. No banks would even look at me. Today's rate hike means those credit card interest rates will likely climb higher, along with bank and new car loans. With mortgage rates nearly doubling in the past year, pending home sales have dropped 8.6% in a month, 20% in one year. In Michigan, Infinity Homes builds for first-time buyers, many of whom now have sticker shock. It's been a noticeable slowdown with traffic into our sales offices, but rates doubling, it was basically traffic's pretty much been cut in half. We're going to be focused on getting inflation back down. Today, Fed Chairman Powell said, that while consumer spending and production are slowing, unemployment remains near 50-year lows. That suggests the U.S. is not currently in a recession. 2.7 million people hired in the first half of the year. Uh, it doesn't make sense that the economy would be in recession with, with this kind of thing happening. Chairman Powell says another rate hike very likely in September, and it could be another big one. Think three quarters of a point, maybe a full percentage point. It'll be based on the economic data they have in September. The Fed has been accused of acting too slowly to get inflation under control, so the pressure is on now for them to act decisively, and they say they are completely aware of that pressure. Tom? All right, Tom, thank you for that. Despite that grim warning from the IMF and today's aggressive rate hike by the Fed, U.S. markets closed higher today. Take a look with the Nasdaq climbing 4% after the announcement. But what does this all mean for the possibility of a recession? I want to bring in our friend CNBC senior analyst Ron Insana. So, Ron, I think a lot of Americans saw the headlines. They immediately looked at their 401k. So, so explain this to us. The big Fed rate hike, but the markets finished strong. Explain that. Well, there are a couple of things that happened there. Uh, the, the Fed acknowledged that the economy is slowing down. Uh, Chairman Powell suggested also that they're probably nearer the end uh, than the middle of their rate hiking cycle. Uh, and indeed, if that's the case, then things like stocks tend to go up rather than down. If the Fed is beginning to, even if we're to raise rates, as Tom suggested, another three quarters of a point uh, come September, there might be one or two small hikes after that. And they could stop, look and listen, if you will, if you want to go back to elementary school and determine what's going on with the economy and try to engineer this so-called soft landing where we don't go into recession. Economy, the economy slows enough for inflation to come down, but doesn't do too much damage to the labor markets. And that's what the Fed is trying to do here. They're threading a, a, a needle, to, to say the very least. Well, well, on that issue of soft landing, we were talking about this last night with Austin Goolsby, and we're seeing sort of a, an economic mixed bag, and I think that's why people are confused. Gas prices are dropping. There's lower unemployment, strong job growth, but inflation still you know, around 9% last month. It's not technically a recession. What, what do you think we're in right now? 
We have an inflation problem. We have an infl inflation problem that is still the result of a, of a global pandemic that is yet to work its way fully through the system. If you look at countries like China, which are still, at least in some instances, in partial lockdown, so we have a shortage of everything from computer chips to potato chips, really. And, and of course, the war in Ukraine has disrupted food and energy supplies in a notable fashion, given that we've sanctioned Russia. So we have supply shortages of all manner of goods. We have relatively normal, if not stronger than normal demand, and that's pushing up prices, pushing up wages. Uh, and the Fed can only do so much. It could lower demand. It could slow the economy enough so that demand equals or, or roughly equals lowered supplies of available goods. And, and we could run the risk of a recession of some sort. Uh, uh, people are beginning to uh, talk about soft landing-ish now as, as the outcome here where the economy slows, maybe we see an uptick in the unemployment rate, and then inflation comes down. Now, we're not going to go from 9% to 2% this year. Well, that well, can't no, okay, happen, but, but Ron, I, want, I do want to ask you about that, because I have here, gas has fallen for the 42nd straight day. Yep. If gas continues to fall, that's obviously going to have an impact on inflation. Could the Absolutely. Fed be overreacting? Well, listen, the Fed, Tom, has a very you know, blunt policy instrument, which is the use of interest rates to solve this problem. Some of this problem is entirely out of the Fed's control, whether oil prices and gasoline prices went up because of the war in Ukraine or Russia cutting off natural gas supplies to Europe, which is weakening their economy and even pushing up natural gas prices here in the United States, whether food costs are going up. These are things that the Fed doesn't typically control, uh, nor does anyone else, for that matter. These are global markets that, when disrupted, see all kinds of wild price movements. So the Fed can do what it can do within the constraints of its ability uh, to solve some of these problems, and the rest simply are going to have to work their way through the system. We're hearing from automakers that we may not get a full you know, batch of chips for another year or so. We're hearing from a wide variety of different industries that they're short goods, or in some instances, because consumers have changed their behavior, they have too much apparel and too little food, or, or, or food is expensive, so people are buying less in the way of clothing. So Walmart's going to mark down some of their inventory while they're marking up some of their other stuff. Fed can't fully control right. all of these things that are taking place in the economy. Ron and Sana for us tonight. Ron, thank you for all the help on that one. We want to turn to Washington tonight with new signs of how far the Justice Department's investigation of the January 6th riot has reached into the Trump White House. Prosecutors asking what the former president was doing in the period leading up to it, a sign of greater focus on Mr. Trump. Here's NBC's Pete Williams. Administration officials familiar with the investigation tell NBC News that Justice Department lawyers are trying to find out what President Trump was saying to those in his inner circle in the weeks leading up to the January 6th riot to try to undo his election loss to Joe Biden. Specifically, the officials say investigators want to know what he was telling his aides and lawyers about the effort to have slates of Trump presidential electors sent in from battleground states that Biden won and about urging Vice President Mike Pence to recognize those slates when Congress met for the official electoral vote count on January 6th. The officials also say investigators back in April obtained telephone records of senior White House aides, including Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. Those developments were first reported by The Washington Post. The fact that those records were obtained at least three months ago is a sign that investigators are moving more aggressively than was first thought. Some Democrats have said the Justice Department is moving too slowly compared to the pace of the House January 6th committee hearings. What we know now is that they have a broad and far-ranging investigation, including of uh, Mr. Trump's conduct, and properly so. The only surprise would be if they weren't looking at Mr. Trump's conduct because he was the one who would benefit from a fake elector scheme. Attorney General Merrick Garland has insisted that no one is off limits to the Justice Department's investigation, telling Lester that it won't matter even if Mr. Trump decides to run again for president. We will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. At a rally on Tuesday in Washington, the former president said the investigations are politically motivated to stop him from running again. They really want to damage me so I can no longer go back to work for you. And I don't think that's going to happen. And in one of the latest steps, investigators are seeking to look at the contents of the cell phone of John Eastman, the lawyer who pushed the idea that the vice president could overturn the election results.
All right, Pete Williams joins us now from Washington. And Pete, I want to be as crystal clear as we can with our viewers because different outlets are reporting this out in different ways. Can you best describe what is happening with the Justice Department and President Trump's actions and some of those of his inner circle in trying to overturn the election? Sure, I think what's happening here is the Justice Department is trying to find out what happened. They're asking questions of people in a position to know. They're still in the fact-finding stage here. What the officials tell me is, don't assume that we've, quote, unquote, opened a criminal investigation of Donald Trump. That would be overstating it. They're, they're still trying to build this case here, it's still trying to understand what happened. So naturally, they want to talk to all the people around him. And if you think about it, it's been a sort of ever-shrinking circle as they get closer and closer to the Oval Office to find out what his role was. What was he telling people to do? What was he asking them about? That's what they want to know. All right, Pete Williams for us tonight. Pete, thank you for that. We head overseas to the war in Ukraine. Russian forces hitting another civilian target, this time destroying a hotel. Ukraine continuing to fight back. Morgan Chesky tonight from Odessa. In eastern Ukraine, a race to rescue after another Russian missile strike. This one leveling a hotel, killing two. Firefighters digging through debris to find one man buried beneath the rubble, but alive. The lone survivor rushed to a nearby hospital. In the Russian-occupied Kherson region, Ukrainian military striking under cover of darkness. Artillery leaving a key bridge badly damaged. One of several small victories in Ukraine's counteroffensive. Mines? Yes, mines. Anti tanks. Near Kharkiv, soldiers gaining ground back after fierce fighting. It was Russian position. Momentum Ukraine's president shared they could build upon, with President Biden following the First Lady by visiting the country. The visit of President Biden to Ukraine would be the strongest signal which can be given in support of Ukraine. Meanwhile, here in Odessa, the clock is ticking to slow a global food crisis. A coordination center opened in Turkey, which will be overseeing the upcoming shipments of grain. All eyes watching after a Russian strike on the port over the weekend. We are afraid from the rocket attack uh, in, in any day. Roman Gregorian sent his wife and young son to western Ukraine for their safety. All our plans, uh, my, the plans of my family, finished uh, on 24th of February. Now, six months in, he, like so many others, doesn't know when they'll be able to come home. And tonight, despite recent missile attacks on the coastal area in Odessa and to the south, we do know that Ukrainian officials say three ports will be ready soon to have those grain exports resume. But right now, no firm timetable on when those first ships will head out across the Black Sea. Tom? Okay, Morgan, we thank you for that. We have new reporting tonight on the coronavirus pandemic, which has now claimed more than 6.4 million lives around the globe. But still questions persist about where it came from. Did it originate at a market where live animals were sold in Wuhan? Or was it the result of some kind of lab leak? Two new studies were released that attempt to answer those questions. I do want to bring in Dr. Amish Adalja, a professor in infectious diseases from John Hopkins University. Welcome back to Top Story, Doctor. I guess the first question I have for you is that in one study, there were mapping tools used from social media apps where they were used to estimate the location of more than 100 of the earliest cases. What did they find when it came to those clusters of early cases? What they find is that many of those cases were in the proximity of the market, which is somewhat supportive of, of the market being the epicenter of the outbreak. We know that many early cases were clustered there, but again, there's still open questions because we don't know what happened in the cases before that. And I think a lot of these answers are going to not come to a full or firm conclusion until we get transparency from the Chinese government. The other study tried to determine when the first infections crossed over from animals into humans. And it, it sort of found two lineages, if that's the right uh, verbiage for this, of the virus. What did they learn? What they learned is both lineages were present at the market. Lineage A was probably considered the ancestral version of this virus, and then lineage B is the one that took off and caused the pandemic. And people are trying to understand the relationship between those two. And what it appears to be is that both cases, both lineages were found in the, in the market, which the authors of the paper hypothesized leads to the idea that there were two spillover events from animals. Again, a lot of this stuff is very suggestive of the, the market being the source. However, there's still not enough, I think, to be able to say that conclusively. The authors say they can't actually say that this was the origin, but it's very suggestive. 
and I think we may never come to the answer unless the Chinese government releases well, data on the early cases that predate it. Before we put a period on that, though, I do want to ask you, though, do the results of either of these studies, do they rule out the lab leak theory? Is that still possible? They don't 100 percent rule it out. Um, they are the, the authors are not proponents of the lab leak theory. But again, I think it's going to be very hard to find definitive evidence one way or the other until we get more information. This is certainly suggestive and supportive of the market being the original source, but there are still some open questions and limitations to that data because they don't have all of it to be able to make such a conclusive statement. Do you think we'll ever get that answer on that? I don't know. I think it's very hard to understand what the Chinese government wants people to know about this. I think they don't want to know one way or the other. And the Chinese government themselves, their official story is that it didn't come from the market. They still have uh, theories about this being imported from another country. So there, there's still a lot of questions on, on what the Chinese government knew and what they want people to know. And it's very difficult to get data on what was happening prior to December of 2019. What about earlier cases that may have been reported in November? What was going on with their respiratory illnesses in November? So there's, there's a lot of open questions, and the WHO does have a commission formed to look into these, uh, these questions, and hopefully we get more information. But I, I think there's, there's still just a lot of unanswered questions, but clearly the market played a role in the spread and dissemination of this infection. That's for, sur for sure. What happened right. before that, what the intermediate animal is, that's something that we still need to know. Yeah, we're still going to have to be studied as much as it can be. Dr. Adalja for us tonight. Doctor, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the golf controversy. President Trump's New Jersey golf course set to host a major tournament. Why 9-11 survivors and victims' families are protesting. Plus, the police officer and former reality TV figure caught on her own body cam using a racial slur. Howard Department is responding tonight. And grave mistake, the family burying a loved one just to learn the wrong person was in the casket. Stephen Romo in the house tonight. He'll have more on this wild story and the major legal action now being taken by that family. Top story just getting started on this Wednesday night. Stay with us. All right, we are back tonight with an alleged body mix-up by a New Jersey funeral home. The family says the wrong person was put in the casket, and they didn't know until after they lowered the casket into the ground. Now they're suing for $50 million. NBC Stephen Romo has more. Tonight, one family sharing their story and saying in a lawsuit, a New Jersey funeral home accidentally switched the body of their loved one with a stranger. As soon as they, they opened it, I told her, this doesn't look like my mom. The family of 93-year-old Kyungja Kim filed the $50 million civil suit against Central Funeral Home of New Jersey and Blackley Funeral Home and Cremation Services of Ridgefield, saying the mix-up at the funeral in November caused emotional distress. We trusted the funeral home, but they violated the trust that was promised to us. The family says in their suit it was only at the memorial service and after the casket was lowered into the ground that the funeral director alerted them to the mistake. She came to me though, took a picture showing me that this lady is in the funeral home right now. Is this your mom? And I said, yes, and I collapsed it. They say it solidified what many relatives suspected throughout the open casket service, that the woman in the casket was not their family member. She's so young. I mean, my mother is 93 and a lot of wrinkles. The lawsuit alleges the woman in the casket was actually 20 years younger than Kim. And that woman had her own teeth while Kim wore dentures. The suit also says that the funeral home employees placed Kim's dentures under the pillow of the coffin with the wrong body inside. NBC News has reached out to the owners of the funeral homes named in the lawsuit and they have not yet responded to our request for comment. The suit also alleges battery for mishandling the body of the deceased and breach of contract. The Kim family telling NBC New York they were offered a refund of their $9,000 check, and they did receive a verbal apology from the funeral homes, but they feel that falls short. I feel so guilty about it to my mom. 
All right, Stephen Romo joins us now live on set. So, Stephen, this is, you know, a disturbing story, also somewhat of a sick story. Do we know what happened once they realized the wrong person was in the casket? Yeah, that's one of the things that the family is so upset about. They say after the wrong body was removed, Kim was buried the next day, but without the church service that she wanted so much. It's one of the things that makes the family so upset, Tom. Yeah, all right, Stephen, we thank you for that. And, of course, WNBC for their help on that story. All right, we want to turn out of the major controversy uh, surrounding the newly formed Liz golf tour. Players and celebrities are gearing up for the tour's event on U.S. soil this weekend, but families of 9-11 victims are protesting the Saudi-backed tournament. Rahima Ellis has the story. Tonight, outrage from families of 9-11 victims in a new ad blasting the upcoming Live Golf Tournament for its Saudi Arabian backing. It's happening at former President Trump's club. This golf tournament is taking place 50 miles from ground zero. It's disgusting. The ad released by the group 9-11 Justice following a separate protest near Trump Bedminster Golf Club where the first round will take place this weekend. We are going to make it as painful as possible and unenjoyable as possible for those involved. And now the National Press Club piling on with a scathing statement calling on Americans to boycott the tournament due to the Saudi government's alleged involvement in the murder of Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018, saying, do not attend, do not watch it on television, let it fail. The Saudis deny involvement in both 9-11 and Khashoggi's murder. Live responding to criticism, telling NBC News, quote, these families have our deepest sympathy. While some may not agree, we believe golf is a force for good around the world. The backlash comes amid a seismic shift in professional golf, following the founding of Live Golf, which aims to compete with the PGA Tour. Live, which is partly funded by a $2 billion investment from Saudi Arabia's Sovereign Wealth Fund, enjoys the backing of Donald Trump. He's had a strained relationship with the PGA Tour after the league withdrew a tournament from one of his courses during his 2016 campaign and another after January 6. The PGA announced in early June that all of the 17 PGA players who signed up to participate in the first live golf tournament would be suspended from the organization. Several of those players chose to resign their memberships. As a result of the ban, PGA Tour is now facing a federal probe over possible anti-competitive practices. Live Golf, meanwhile, enticing players with massive cash purses. This weekend's $20 million purse nearly double that of any on the PGA Tour, and even more than the famed U.S. Open. It was enough to win over golf superstar Phil Mickelson, who responded to criticism at last month's press event. This is uh, an opportunity that gives me a, a chance to have the most balance uh, in my life uh, going forward. Meanwhile, other prominent golfers such as Tiger Woods and Rory McIlroy choosing to stick to the PGA. Any decision that you make in your life that's purely for money usually doesn't end up going the right way. A harsh criticism of his colleagues, but one shared by many of the 9-11 families protesting the tournament. What this tournament will do is showcase how easily people can be corrupted by money. But the ire isn't directed just at golfers. Protesters are concerned with the current president's trip to Saudi Arabia, too. It was disgraceful. It was painful to watch such a, you know, such a nonchalant way of, of meeting with him. You need to have a really serious conversation with him about September 11th. And he blew it. Rahima Ellis, NBC News. Okay, coming up next, the splash landing caught on camera. Take a look. The small plane crashing into the waters near Seattle. An update on how that pilot who was saved by beachgoers is doing tonight. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we start with the Cincinnati police officer who was caught on her own body cam using racist, racist slurs outside of a high school. Dumb. Oh, I hate him so much. God, I hate this world. I hate him. Wow, that officer, Rose Valentino, regularly appeared on the TLC reality series Police Women of Cincinnati in 2011. She has been assigned to desk duty as the department investigates. An investigation also tonight after a small plane crash landed off the coast of Seattle. We've been showing you this amazing video throughout the broadcast. Cell phone video shows the plane landing on the Puget Sound before tipping over. 
That 66-year-old pilot was able to swim to shore. He was taken to the hospital but is recovering. The plane later sank. No one else was injured. And a major headline from the medical world, the fifth person has likely been cured of HIV. Scientists say it appears a 66-year-old man, American man, is no longer showing any signs of the virus after a specialized stem cell transplant. The transplant was in 2018, and he has been off treatment for 17 months. Another woman in Spain is in long-term remission after receiving immune-boosting therapies as part of a clinical trial. That's great news. Okay, and singer Sean Mendez is canceling the rest of his world tour dates to focus on his mental health. The singer making the announcement on Instagram saying he's spoken to his team and to health professionals before making the decision, of course. He wrote to his fans that he hopes to, quote, come back stronger. Mendez originally postponed the tour earlier this month to prioritize his health. Okay, we want to move on now to some international news. The escalating tensions between China and Taiwan. Now a possible trip to the island by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is adding fuel to a really delicate dynamite, a dynamic situation. NBC's Matt Bradley has that story. Tonight, tensions building between Taiwan and China with the United States in the middle. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is planning to visit the island next month. She would be the highest ranking U.S. elected official to visit since 1997. I think that it's important for us to show support uh, for Taiwan. And NBC News reporting today, she's invited other senior lawmakers. But the Biden administration seems concerned. I think that the military thinks it's not a good idea right now. But uh, I I don't know what the status of it is. President Biden and his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping are expected to talk on Thursday, with Reuters reporting Taiwan will be a key agenda item, according to a source familiar with the planning. Taiwan is self-governed, but China claims it as part of its territory, and Beijing has never ruled out taking the island by force. Taiwan rejects China's sovereignty claim and vows to defend itself. The U.S. doesn't officially recognize Taiwan as a separate country due to its long-standing one-China policy, but it has pledged support to the country in case of an attack or coercion. The geopolitical friction getting extra attention in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The concern that Russia's invasion and the world's response to it may embolden China. Taiwan's representative to the United States said this in February as Russian troops were mobilizing before their attack on Ukraine. Like everyone else in the world, we are watching the situation with much concern and anxiety. The Chinese have been threatening Taiwan through a number of means. Since Russia's war in Ukraine began, the White House has struggled with its messaging. President Biden made headlines with this exchange with a reporter in May. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. White House officials later clarifying that the U.S. was sticking to its historic policy. Nothing's changed about our one China policy. But the U.S. military says Beijing has already been rattling its saber. General Mark Milley said over the weekend that China has become significantly more and noticeably more aggressive over the past five years. Now, Taiwan is also stepping up their visible military presence, staging air raid drills early this week ahead of Pelosi's trip. There's a rare bipartisan support for Pelosi's visit to push back on Chinese aggression. We're not going to let the Chinese Communist Party dictate where the Speaker of the House should go. I think uh, China should not have any say over where American officials travel. But China's foreign ministry firing back at Pelosi's plans with a firm warning. We are fully prepared. If the U.S. insists on going its own way, China will certainly take firm and forceful measures to safeguard its national sovereignty and territorial integrity. The question for Washington, what are those firm and forceful measures? Or is Beijing just bluffing? Matt Bradley, NBC News. All right, we thank Matt for that report. For more on this escalating tension, I want to bring in Gordon Chang. He's a historian and the author of The Coming Collapse of China and the Great U.S.-China Tech War. Gordon, the White House seemed concerned about the prospects of this trip. Do you think this proposed visit by Speaker Pelosi is a provocative act? And is the threat of someone kind of response, what is the the response from China you think going forward? For China, everything is a provocative act. But I believe Speaker Pelosi needs to go now that China has made this a test of wills, because we cannot allow the Chinese to think that they've got a veto over American foreign policy. 
What Beijing will do, I think, will be determined on what they believe President Biden will do. Now, there's been talk that China will declare a no-fly zone over Taipei, though there's some other things that they've been talking about in the air. But ultimately, this is a question of their reading of American political will. Do you think the people of Taiwan, do you think the, the people all across the world should be worried about what's going to happen with China and Taiwan? We should definitely be worried, because the Chinese, for a very long time, and this predates the Biden administration, has thought the United States is in terminal decline and that Beijing could basically do what it wants. Um, but Beijing has been emboldened because of the problems in Afghanistan and Ukraine, and now they think that they can actually affect American foreign policy and make us do what they want. So uh, it's up to President Biden to show them that they're wrong, and that's always a dangerous time in history when you try to reestablish deterrence. Okay, so so you're saying China is obviously watching that Russia and Putin made a move on Biden into Ukraine. So you're thinking that possibly. They could do this as well. Do you, do you really think China would, would, would take military action into Taiwan? Normally, I don't think that they would. There's a lot of other reasons for them not to. But we've got to remember that Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler, has a very different calculus of interest. He's got severe problems at home. A crisis abroad would be perfect for him right now, especially because he wants a third term, which is precedent-breaking third term, as general secretary of the Communist Party. That will be decided if tradition holds sometime in October or November of this year. And that means, basically, right now, he can take us by surprise. And, and do you think there'll be any warning signs? There were a lot from Russia before they went to the Ukraine. Would China sort of operate in, in that same capacity where there'd be a buildup of military forces on the coast or something to that degree? I think the Chinese would tell us what they're doing before they do it. Um, as James Lilly, our famous ambassador to Beijing in the 1980s and 1990s, said, the Chinese always telegraph their punches. So I don't expect a sneak attack. But um, once they have told us um, what they're going to do, then they can move in a very sneaky fashion. Okay. Gordon Chang, we thank you so much for joining Top Story again tonight. We want to turn to Top Story's global watch in the mass protest in Iraq's green zone. New video shows hundreds of protesters inside the parliament building in Baghdad. No lawmakers were inside at the time. The demonstrators, who were mostly followers of an influential Shiite clerk, cleric, were protesting against a nominee for prime minister chosen by Iran-backed parties. Next to the deadly earthquake in the northern Philippines, widespread damage in the Abra province after the magnitude 7 quake triggered landslides and collapsed buildings. At least five people dead and dozens injured. Two hospitals in Manila also evacuated as a precaution. And Shakira's tax fraud case is now going to trial in Spain. The singer's PR team confirming she rejected an offer by Spanish prosecutors to settle the case, saying she is, quote, fully confident of her innocence. She's accused of failing to pay about $14 million in taxes between 2012 and 2014. The date for that trial has not yet been set. When we come, the change that has some Instagram users up in an uproar, the new look that could be coming to your feed, and why it has influencers like the Kardashians speaking out against it. Stay with us. All right, back now with the big changes in the world of social media. Facebook and Instagram are testing moves that will allow them to compete better with the Internet's fastest rising star, TikTok, of course. The changes are not welcome by all, including stars like the Kardashians. Here's NBC's Jacob Ward to break it all down. Some of the world's most influential social media platforms responding to backlash from users, influencers, and even celebrities. Facebook has always been about friendships and connections. Instagram lets you see your friend's pictures, but now those experiences may be changing. Facebook is testing a major redesign, showing posts based on your interests and an algorithm instead of posts that connect you with your inner circle. And Instagram drawing the most attention. The app originally known for artful photos now focusing on video. Introducing a full screen feed where photos and videos take up the whole screen. And including recommendations of other users' posts in your feed as well as friends and contacts. Now, powerful users are pushing back. While people love video, they kind of say there's like a time and a place for that. Some point out the app now feels more like TikTok, the trend-setting platform popular with younger users. 
Kylie Jenner and Kim Kardashian, who hold some of the most popular Instagram accounts, both reposted this meme to their hundreds of millions of followers, imploring the platform to stop trying to be TikTok. User reaction so strong, it forced Instagram CEO Adam Masseri to respond. There's a lot going on in Instagram right now. We're experimenting with a number of different changes to the app. And so we're hearing a lot of concerns from all of you. I need to be honest. I do believe that more and more of Instagram is going to become video over time. An Instagram spokesperson stressing to NBC News, the changes are, quote, just a test, and that Instagram is still where your friends and interests meet to push culture forward. But that may be part of the problem. In a lot of ways, Instagram has made the same mistake that Facebook made, which is trying to be too many things to too many people and losing focus along the way. TikTok was the most downloaded app in 2021 and through the first quarter of 2022, a growth largely fueled by Gen Z users born in the late 1990s and early 2000s. TikTok is so attention-grabbing that after too much scrolling, it actually encourages some users to take a break. Meta, formerly known as Facebook, seems to want to be that captivating. But it faces a dilemma. Stay relevant or stay true to what it was? We've heard people say, I want Instagram to be Instagram. I want Facebook to be Facebook. Something to note here, as Facebook rolls out its changes later this year, the company says it will provide a way for users to still see all those updates from family and friends chronologically in a separate feed. Facebook has not responded to our request for comment. Back to you. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.